Lancaster Woodturners Weekly Coffee Hour for number 164 for August 17th, 2023. My name's John Kelsey. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, let's see. With the show and tell day, let me, I don't know if I have any announcements. Uh, you guys had open shop last week. I went to the Goshenhoffen Festival. Barry's got an announcement. Barry, go for it. Yeah, I just want to uh, put out a call for if we can get any more volunteers for September 9th for the uh, Lancaster Music Fest. Uh, Ron has signed up. I'm going to be there. It's a uh, the overall response. The overall gig is from noon until five. Uh, so we're going to be uh, demonstrating on a mini lathe. Uh, the lathe will be there in place and. Uh, if you can make it to the Lancaster area, uh, you could use a, an hour or two of your time. That would be terrific. Uh, I'll probably show up for that. I'll turn some tops and some Easter eggs. I'll Great. bring some wood too, yeah. Um, in fact, I'm gonna open this morning then with uh, with a video I made the other day about long long tapers. I was gonna talk about this before. I, the, the circumstances was I, I left my cane at a friend's house up in Woodstock. So I needed to make another one. So I'm going to show you a video, and then um, I got some some stuff I'd like to discuss about turning long long thin spindles. Okay, here's where I'm going with this thing. This is a walking cane. For me, this should be about 33 inches from here to here. Uh, this is a metal fitting. You can also make them with a wooden handle, and then this is a wooden piece that fits through here with a tenon, and then this has a tenon here that fits into the bottom here, and there's a screw, and you can put glue, and it has a brass ferrule at the foot. Uh, the key thing to know is that this is three quarters of an inch in diameter and this is about an inch and a sixteenth on the outside. So those are my key dimensions uh, and I'm going to turn the spindle. Three quarter inch spindle roughing gouge I'm going to use for this exercise. I sharpen the right wing with a little bit of a curve back and no sharp corner up here and the left wing dead straight like a skew and a curve in between so there's a little bit of a slope there. That lets me do a roughing cut that removes a lot of material with this side over here in the bowl. And then it lets me plane the surface with a very straight edge, and that's this one over here. You'll see in the little video I'm going to make. I'm not going to use a steady rest for this operation. I've made a half a dozen of them over the years, and none of them work worth a damn. I'd rather just use my hands. And at the start, I got a lot of support from the headstock, so I'm going to barrel right in there with the deep bowl of the gouge and get the round as quick as I can. And I'm going to use the slightly curved right hand edge of the gouge just to get the corners off as far as I can reach along this standard tool rest. My right hand, my power hand, is locked into my body, and my left hand glides along the tool rest with my thumb bracing the gouge. Feels good, looks good. Now I'm going to move the tool rest over to the next section and then carefully knock the sharp corners off with the curved portion of the spindle gouge. I've got a round section to work off. I'm going to change to a one hand grip with my right hand aiming and pointing the gouge, and my left hand wrapped around the spindle with my thumb pushing the gouge while it slides along the tool rest. This grip lets me push into the square section, uh, whittling down about two linear inches at a time. The middle section of the spindle can be kind of whippy and it's usually better to work the other way around going from square down into the round section as you can see me doing here. Again taking a couple inches at a time and the key thing is to use the right hand to brace and point and control the tool and the left hand wrapped around the spindle with the thumb riding on the tool rest and bearing against the gouge to brace it. Lane the surface smooth and clean with long straight cuts of sliding along the tool rest swing from your ankle. 
The lathe speed is somewhere between 1200 and 1500, much faster and your hand gets too hot too quickly. And the last section at the tailstock has almost as much support as the headstock end did, so you can take conventional cuts to get around pretty quickly. Uh, and a finger touching the work is the easiest way and the quickest way to know whether there are any flat corners left. You can hear it and you can feel it. This last little bit is probably the most difficult to do, but just keep taking small bites until it all smooths out into a straight, clean cylinder. Next I'm going to set a caliper to the small dimension, which is three quarters of an inch at the ferrule end. Now reset to the large dimension, one and an eighth at the handle end. I'm using the same one-handed pointer grip on the parting tool with the caliper in my left hand and I part until it just slips over the wood. Then split the difference to about seven eighths for a final part in the middle of the spindle. Then it's back to the tailstock end to make to start the taper and continue it all the way up the cane. Uh, using the same grips as before, guiding with the thumb, always with a hand wrapped around the workpiece and braced on the tool rest. Your fingers can sense and feel extraordinarily small differences in smoothness and diameter. So trust how it feels more than how it looks. Make these long planing cuts with the straight left hand edge of the gouge. And make each cut as long as you can with each positioning of the tool rest. And keep the tool rest close to the work for a short fulcrum and less risk of a catch. Finally sand from one end to the other using 120 grit paper on a hard rubber block. If you're turning the mess, start with 80 grit. Now I want to tell you what happened after I made that video, and then I'd like to hear your opinions of uh, turning long thin spindles. Um, I sent the video to my old friend Dennis Belcher, who's been a long, uh, long time friend of this this uh, production. Uh, he fired back to say, "Well, you know, the, uh, the real wood turners would start in the middle and work out from the middle toward both ends, uh, and then I'd plane with a skew and I would be able to sand at 320." So I I took that to heart and I went down to the shop. And I, uh, I found a really nice piece of uh, cypress. Cypress is fairly bendy, but it's, this is old growth, with really tight rings. And so I tried it his way. And uh, what happened was I got nice turning at both ends, but in the middle I couldn't get control of it. It got all kind of ribby and vibrating, and it's smaller in diameter in here than I wanted because of me chewing away at it. Um, and I think that was because I started in the middle. So I don't agree with that advice. Um, and then I also tried this, went back to the skew. I like the skew, and I tr worked with the skew on this thing. But I found, and I've found before, that the long spindles, the roughing gouge actually does a better job for me. If you can get the skew in there and go uh, a heavy skew, and you can go straight along and raise a, raise a shaving as you go, uh, that tends to work better than, uh, than a light cut. Uh, just a sec, I'm going to spotlight that again. If, if you really, if you if your force with the skew is all axial, you can get a really good cut. As soon as you're putting any force this way, out in the middle, it's going to start to vibrate and make ribs. And even with your good hand around it, you really have a hard time getting control of it. So, so that's my experience with these. And and after I finished this, this little exercise in the video, I remembered something that Mike Darlow told me a couple of years ago about turning thin spindles. Uh, he said, don't use a drive center in the, in the headstock. Uh, keep a square section and catch it in a chuck. 
and and that will stabilize the whole spindle a lot more. And he's absolutely right. Every time I've tried that, it's been enormously easier than turning between conventional centers. So that's uh, that's that's my contribution on spindles. I would always do it with a spindle roughing gouge, and 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 I I'm used to make those damn steady rests. Uh, I never had a store bought one, but I've made oh, I don't know three or four of them, five of them over the years. And every one of them is a problem. They never quite work right, and they bang around, and they're a nuisance to get on, and they're in the way. So I finally I concluded in doing a lot of these kind of things that the uh, spindle roughing gouge is the tool of choice. And while I'm on it, I um, I'm going to just say a bit about cane hardware. I really like this fitting, uh, and I've used it a half three or four times, and I've ordered some more of them. And I've also made a wooden version of it. Uh, I don't have this ferrule here. Instead, a tenon on this on this shaft going out right up through this. Uh, the problem with making it out of wood is you can't get it to be delicate enough. It tends to be bulkier. But I'm going to try and change that by using some really hard wood, maybe Osage. I don't know, and see if I can get a get a, a wood all wood equivalent to a cane made this way. I also found, and I have found that the foot tip. Woodcraft has a. This is from Woodcraft, Wood River brand. It's really nice. It has a. They give you two washers or rubber washers with it. The ones that come from Rockler and Treeline are straight rather than tapered. They're not nearly as nice. Uh, Treeline, which I think is one of the craft supply spinoffs, has an awful lot of cane handles and medallions. So if you want a cane handle, that's the place to go. And the other kind of hardware. Well, a couple of kinds of hardware to know about. Getting the length right is important. Um, and I've used one of these. This is, you know, the kind of cane that you see old geezers with all the time that has a uh, little bullet so you can adjust it an inch at a time. Uh, I've consistently found I need a cane a little shorter than I think. Um, and the true length for the cane, for me anyway, seems to be to stand up straight with my shoes on and catch the crease between the wrist and the hand right there. If I catch that height there with my arm hanging easily at my side, that's the right length for the cane. Any longer and it kind of gets in your way sometimes. The other thing is these things, these center, uh, you know, for making a travel cane. They all sell these, these, the, I can't get this one apart because it's, they all sell these two-part threaded inserts that you can use to make the shaft divide. And I found that the ones from Treeline and from Rockler are sized appropriately for canes. And the ones from Woodcraft are bigger and also more nicely machined. And I think that they are meant for pool cues, and I think Woodcraft is selling them for canes, but they're too big and uh, a little too f a, little, a little too elegant. I think if you want if you want to do this thing sort of thing and make a two or a three part cane, I think the the uh, piece the the uh, inserts you get from Rockler and Treeline are, are better and more more suited to the problem. Uh, they will all sell you these big rubber feet of different kinds, and they'll all sell you feet that convert into hiking shafts, too. And I've experimented with all of those, but I like the, uh, here's one of those, this one here. This, this, this one screws off, and it gives you a, hike, a spike for on ice or for hiking, but I can't imagine I'd ever remember to do that if I was in that situation. So, uh, and this, these things come in three sizes. This is a, a medium. They make a bigger one, and they also make a smaller one, which I've ordered one of so I can try it. So that's everything I know about canes and long taper turning. Comments? Questions? Very helpful. Very helpful. Jay, what do you got to say? Jack. Jack, you had your hand up. Yeah, so um, I've noticed that when... <clears throat> People are using cane stuff. It looks better when there is metal accents than just straight wood. Like um, I have one here that I carved. Well, this part I didn't carve. This one I cast it out of metal. But this one through here, see, it's got metal. Nice work. And it also. Nice work. A bit of unscrewing. Now, what hardware is that that you're using there? Is that from who's that from? Uh, I. I made this. You made the, 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 the join piece as well? Yeah, it's just a screw that I saw in half. Okay. And how about the cane head? How do you I mean you... I just used a knife and sandpaper. You didn't turn the cane. You, you, you whittled it? I didn't. Yeah, I whittled it. I don't have a lathe currently. And how about the head? The, did you turn that or, or cast that? So, yeah, I casted this out of metal. 
And so, so what I did was I got sand put into a box and got my 3D printer to print like a bird looking thing. And then, yeah, casted it out of metal. Wow. That's terrific work, Jack. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, John. Um, uh, I sometimes go skiing, and in Europe, the pointed uh, hiking type uh, sticks are very popular because in a lot of places, they do not apply salt to sidewalks. So a lot of times you will find ice on the sidewalks. And almost yep. everybody has has two, they're not canes, but they're walking sticks. Kind of like a cross between a, a ski pole, uh, but they have a sharp point on the end. I'm gonna make a pair of those next, actually. That's uh, my next plan, yeah. Hey, John, the other question I have is, I didn't go back and look at the video. You ground your gouge with a round on one side and tipped on the uh, sharp on the other, uh, pointed on the other. Why did you do that? I wanted to get, I found, I found that this, this wing here catches in the wood. And, and I, I, I wanted to be able to make a clean cut that didn't have any corner to dig in there. So I ground that corner off and kind of made a little very small curve, not much of a curve. Uh, I, but I've kept the gouge that way. I've just found it to work better for my purposes with, with two different edges on it. Uh, and I also noticed, I found often that you, when you, with the straight edge and with the bowl, you can actually go in both directions and get a really clean cut back, going back and forth, taking a little wee off each time. What you can't do, and, and this is the terrible, the hard part about this is once you get ribbing in there, it is really hard to get rid of it. Once once it starts to vibrate and it starts to make a, a, a harmonic kind of ribbing along the shaft, uh, you'd think a really light cut could pair that off, but it doesn't seem to. It seems to just play into sympathetic harmonics and just dig in. The uh, Basically, you have a gouge on that side then, don't you? I mean, the way you curve that a little bit. It isn't very much curved, but it's it's mostly to get rid of the sharp corner and the curve results uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, but yeah, I think it's better for me. Hey, John, you try, one thing you could try, John, is uh, uh, start turning from the tailstock end because then you keep the mass, uh, even the square mass, as long as possible. And if you go from the tailstock end all the way to the headstock, you'll have a little bit more uh, rigidity because it's square I in the was center. That same thing. Yeah. That's I exactly was... what I tried. I've used to do it that way because that's the conventional wisdom, but it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work because I want to get my hand around the round section, and I can't reverse hands well enough to do it from the tail. So I do it from the head because I'm right hand right handed. So my right hand is my power hand, and my left is my control hand. So I want to get my left hand around the workpiece, and if I'm turning from the tail. Uh, I can't do it. I got the too much square, and I find it's bet. I get a better result um, being able to get my hand into the action right away, working from the head, than I do working conventionally from the tail to try and keep a lot of bulk in there. That's my my own experience. Yeah, yeah. I, I I agree though. The conventional wisdom is to keep the bulk of the wood square as long as you can and work from the tail. I just Good. found that that never worked for me. Talking about using your hand to sta stabilize. I saw down in Philadelphia, I saw a Turner using a skew on a piece that was three feet long and three sixteenths in diameter. And that thing was absolutely true the whole length. Did a beautiful job. But I mean, he had a blazingly sharp skew and did a nice job. But he was holding the thing the whole way down. Uh, that I aspire to be able to do that, and uh, yes, the skew has to be razor sharp. You, you don't get anywhere if your skew is is in the slightest dull or has the slightest dub over on the edge. It's got to be razor sharp and clean and straight. Yeah, that, that, your your comment about holding the square and the chuck is uh, spot on. I make quite a few uh, drop spindles for uh, spinners, 
And uh, I, a lot of times I'll finish them without tailstock support and they're 12 inches long and a quarter inch in diameter. You I got one here it. in my hand, it's only, that's only 18 inches long, but with my background, can't, you can't see much of it. You can't see it past your background. Get it in front of your yeah. face. But at any rate, it's... Uh, Get it right in front of your face. There you go. There you go. Uh, it's, about, it's about a quarter inch of diameter, 18 inches long. I, I, I'm going to keep practicing. I want to be able to do that. Hey, John, the other question I have is a very fundamental one. Once you start getting those synchronous bumps, isn't that time to reach for a scraper and just hold it steady on the tool and just take those high points off? Because you're just going to keep repeating with a gouge or something that's rubbing the bevel, right? No? I, yes? You might have a chance of doing that. You might. You just might continue to resonate. It's just once you get that started, it's you, you, what you got to do is not let it start. <laughs> That's the key. The other thing is to use the uh, roughing gouge point as a skew. Yes. The other thing, John, can I just mention something? I noticed you were holding your gouge by the end of the uh, handle, right? Now, when you started, when you were doing it for coming down, you had your finger across. I always find holding the, the bolt of the handle and resting the other part of the handle under your arm, you've got a bit more control when you're doing your first roughing. Uh, that The way you're doing it now was when you come to your final cuts and yeah. you had your hand over. I'm talking about when you got it in square section, you're getting it down to the first round. You were holding it at the end. I find yeah. the bulk and then use the arm as and the uh, gouge handle in the forearm. And I find I'll get a lot more control on that first cut. I think he's right. Yeah. Anybody else? The other thing is, John, did you change the angle of your rest or did you have it parallel to the piece tried to have it parallel to the piece do you yeah um, i don't I, I find if i change the angle it just gets confused all right because i i i made myself a, an extra long rest for doing spindles which is made out of a piece of angle iron with two pillars and with a second banjo so i've got at least half the length of a three foot uh, piece to turn. And I find now that I, very, very helpful. I have a photo of that from uh, Mike Brazo uh, that I oh, can show you, you here. There you are, I'm gonna spotlight that. Uh, Mike sent me that overnight. Uh, yeah, that's, the, that's that very situation. I do that with a round rod with, with, with a puppet in the banjo at the headstock end and then a block of wood bolted onto the tailstock that'll catch it. But I find it also a, a pain to set that up. I found it for making one, it's just as easy to keep moving the single gout, uh, the uh, single tool rest, the ordinary tool rest, um, because I don't have a second banjo. If I had a second banjo, I think I would do exactly this. Yeah, yeah. And, and somebody yeah. last week made a pretty good point for a second banjo as well, that, uh, you can use the second banjo to get at the backside of a bowl. You park it by the headstock and leave it there. Uh, that was a great idea. And then I went online and found that a second banjo for my age is almost $400. So no, I don't think so. Okay, John, I noticed that you, you one side of your roughing gouge, you have it almost swept back a little bit. Yeah. I'm interested in what other people do because I like having a swept back a little bit, maybe five degrees instead of 85 degrees instead of 90 degrees. I'm interested in thoughts from other people on that. Mine is ground back, if that means anything. Both sides. Now, Jonathan Wilson uh, here, you, uh, let me see, use the chuck, yep. Between centers always seem to create bow. Uh, the height of the rest is absolutely paramount. I agree with that too. Uh, you wanna to talk to that, Jonathan? Where are you? Where's Jonathan Wilson? Good morning. There you are. Um, that tool, I, I, I am 
still learning. So I, I don't want to come off as a know-it-all, but I find challenges with spindle work and love to do it. I'm pretty good with the skew. But that absolute tool height, rest tool height needs to be spot on because if it's not and it's a millimeter, half millimeter below or a half millimeter high, you're not going to get the shavings you want. If you're not supporting with the follow hand, in my case, my less dominant hand, and the tool height's off, it can create those ridges and you're not going to get them out. And if you go to the scraper, I don't think the scraper is the answer. You need to go to back to a cutting tool. Or sand that sand tool sand height sand. literally playing in, in millimeters and bits. Well, I find that with the skew. I want that tool right so I get the skew on top of the work, not on the face yes, of sir. the work. Yes, yes exactly, sir. Yeah. And I think that's and the true. Other one is that angle on the cutting edge, it needs to be an angle. It can't be dead on. It's got to be an angle. It, it's got to be an absolute cutting cutting edge. So just to just to still trying to learn. So just to suggest. I think, no, I think that's right. And I also think what Don said about you can you can even turn the, the you can you can get the roughing gouge to act almost exactly like a skew by tilting it up. And you can even turn it upside down and use it like a skew. So I, I've tried all of that and found uh, get useful cuts there. But you're right. The only way to get those bumpies out of it is is a is a planing cut that is axial rather than radial. Can you spend just a moment longer explaining what what the correct tool rest height is? Like what's what's the goal? higher ah. the high goal is to be working closer to the top of the work than on the face of the work okay got it thanks it gives you much better vision and much better control john a quick side question i noticed when you were holding up the skew um not the skew the spindle um do you sharpen that with a stone or with a cbn uh, CBN and then stone. That I, I go CBN and then I make sure and take the burr out. Okay. With a with a little diamond slip stone, um, and then I can touch up with uh with this with this slip stone, and I do that. I I tend to do that, but I can I think I get a better edge off the wheel, and then getting the burr out of there. Okay. The thing is, fresh edge is what a, a fresh edge makes a lot of difference, especially with a skew. May I ask the side question? Scrapers, do you guys sharpen them with stones or with CBNs? Which one raises a better burr? Depends on what you're trying to do. If you want a, a, a long burr uh, for roughing, uh, then take them straight off a, a, a fairly coarse CBN wheel. If you want a, fine, a really fine burr, uh, take that burr off and then raise it with a ticketer. A burnisher. Uh, I, I actually invested in a carbide burnisher, which I'm very happy with. It's a three eighths inch carbide rod that uh, sits in a handle, and that does a great job of raising a really super clean burr for finish work. Here we're halfway through the hour. I'm, unless somebody's dying to speak on this, I'm going to move along to other people now. Thank you very much. This was a very helpful discussion. Uh, Dave Delo. You're oh, muted, I think. There we go. Hey, uh, I just had a, a question about uh, chainsaw bars and uh, oiling. And I never paid any uh, much attention to uh, this until recently uh, when I was using uh, a 24 inch bar. And I, I kind of felt that I wasn't uh, uh, getting the oil necessary for that larger bar but like i said i've never noticed this before but this is the uh oiling hole uh, of all the bars that i've come across it's yeah. circular okay and uh i uh bought a different bar and i i didn't notice it but i didn't think it was uh oiling properly but i discovered that uh this oiling hole is uh, drilled at an angle and it's much smaller than uh, uh, traditional that, that I've known about. 
I guess uh, this isn't a new deal, but uh, uh, I just never run across it. And so, you know, I've uh, uh, looked on the uh, Arborist site and uh, uh, Forestry Forum, and I, I guess uh, a lot of guys just drill that hole out uh, that's at a slant to get more oil to the bar. And uh, um, I was just curious if anybody else has run into this situation. I did drill out uh, one of my old uh, 24 inchers and made that hole a little bit larger, okay? And uh, I haven't tested it out on actual pieces. I just did it on some cardboard. Uh, and fired it up. And I, I think I do get a little bit more oil, but th the whole thing was about uh, that small of a hole, just uh, uh, clogging up a lot faster than, uh, than, a, than the round hole. And I don't know if anybody else has uh, encountered this uh, and not anything, made any modifications or uh, just never paid any attention to it. Uh, anybody got any, uh, any thoughts on that? Anybody new? What new to me? What brand of bar are you using? Well, this is an or. Well, I get this was a Forester bar, okay, that I uh, uh, had uh, rounded out. But uh, th this is a an Oregon bar, and they're doing they're doing the same thing. And I guess Steel is doing the has done this also. And uh, I, I don't know. Uh, there, I guess there's two. Uh, schools of thought that, that I've come across is it's almost like having a hose and water and you have a uh, flow okay but if you squeeze that uh, squeeze that hose down you get more velocity and I think that, that is the reasoning behind going with this type of uh, oiling hole um, but uh, I, I, I find uh, maybe 10% of the people agree with that. And about 90% 90, 90 of them say, ah, we just drilled out, we just drill it out or uh, we just make the hole bigger. And I just wanted to- think else my, to, next question, my next question yeah. would be is uh, what kind of oil are you using? Because I've got friends that work in the logging industry and they've run chainsaws forever. And um, uh, they've never ever uh, modified a bar still in uh, Oregon or, uh, I mean, they're the state of the art. And I've never heard that problem. Although I have had some of them tell me they use different oil in winter and summer. Yeah, I, I use a, a summer bar oil from a from a Husky dealer, so it, it's good oil. Uh, it's it's not. Uh, I'm not using uh, used motor oil or anything like that. I think that I, oil do know, I do notice a, a little bit of difference, a, a greater flow on this uh, one that I modified a little bit. I, I don't know. Did anybody ever, ever uh, come across that? I guess not. Hey, hey, Dave, do you flip your bar? Yeah, every time I turn the chain or uh, oh, there put you in go. the chain. If they, man they manufacture it, they tell you to flip the bar. It, it should not, doesn't seem like it makes any difference. No, so, no, it doesn't. Jonathan Wilson, you got your hand up again? What do we, you got a comment? Yeah. Um, so Oregon makes bars and they're very good at it. They don't make chainsaws. And one of the reasons that they put that angle in there is to match some of the other manufacturers, specifically Echo. So the lining up of where the tooling, where that drop would fall onto the chain, sometimes doesn't match. So they put that angle in there. Sometimes it increases, sometimes it decreases. The suggestion I would make is still an individual learning in life. Turn the oiler up and then mix the oil. So you can mix cold and summer and you get a thinner mix and you're good to go. You're, if you're in deep wood and you're burying that bar for a long time, go with a thinner mix. It's not gonna hurt you. Yeah. Um, if you're in the middle of summer and you're deep in a bar, go with a thick mix because you want that oil in there. But the, the benefit of the, the cold stuff is, is the thin and sometimes you can mix the two, but modifying the bar is a great idea. The suggestion I would make, um, would be leave the oiler alone, turn it up, but worry about your ridges, worry about your chain, where your chain's riding. If you can make certain that that's honed and planed and flat, your bar will outlive you. So yeah, yeah. 
I, I, I do have the oiler up. It doesn't matter whether I've got an 18 inch bar on or 20 or the 24, I, I have it on. I, I don't care if oil hits the ground. Right, right. The other one liner is if you're in that and you've buried the bar, um, and this is probably going to be wrong and I'll apologize to the membership and it's in advance, but pull the throttle. You're not playing. Pull the throttle and go to work. Don't, don't be nice with it. And the throttle is direct related to how quickly that's going to draw that oil out. Don't be playing with it. Don't be half throttling it. Don't be quarter throttling it and then touch and feel and stuff. Hammer down and get, and, and get into it. So get, get, you're there to get hot and sweaty and dirty don't don't play so you'll have fun you'll be fine <laughs> thanks anybody else on this good topic okay uh let's see jeff carroll we haven't heard from you in a while what are you going to show us uh my first attempt at segmented wow and how did that go did you run into stuff problems you weren't expecting no um we had a clinic on it and the um guy putting it on brought his drum sander um and he had the clamps made it, it were everything was went real smooth um and then we just put it together at the clinic and brought it home and turned it but um i was pleased with it it um everything went pretty smooth with it Nice work. Hold it up again, please. And what's your finish? Uh, general bowl finish. And what did you do to flatten each ring? That was a drum sander. Uh, after after we glued them together, we ran them through a, a drum sander um, until all the edges were, were flat. So that worked really well. And then glued the, um, had a press that we glued the uh, rings together with. Do you have a drum sander in your own shop? No, I do not. Um, I think that was probably the key to um, doing segmenting. How did you cut your segments? Uh, he actually brought the segments cut and oh. he just had boxes of them. We just put it together. Um, but he used a table saw and had a jig um, mm -hmm. made for it to where he just ran the strips through on his uh, table saw. Mm -hmm. now, do you think I've that's better than a chop saw? I've done them on a miter saw also. Which is better, Ron? Uh, they both work. The miter saw is extremely accurate. Uh, some people will tell you if you do them on a miter saw, you, you need to have a sanding jig to sand the angle perfectly, but I was able to get a, a perfect ring that closed up right off the miter saw. And I have that wedgie sled jig that, that, that Bennett invented uh, to cut them on a table saw. And that's very, that's accurate and convenient. Ron, I assume you do the same thing when you cut with a miter saw, you let the blade stop before you lift the saw blade. If you don't, they're going to fly all over the room. And they'll get nicks in the corner. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Good, good information. Thank you, Jeff. Now, Ron, you got, while you, while you're there, what do you, you got your hand up? Do you want to say something else? Yeah, I, uh, I'm making some pieces to donate to hospice auction. And this is a small one. This wow. is uh, beach, and spalted, a lot of, a lot of uh, grain in it. This one is 13 inches by about six and in, five inches high. And this is a core that came out of the big one. Wow. So this where did you get a piece of beach that size? This is 16 inches by about five and a half, six inches tall. You say that's beach? That's beach, yeah. Where did you get a piece of beach that big? Uh, this came from the Muth Tobacco Shop in Lancaster. I've had this for about three or four years in the shop, and I didn't have anything to donate the hospice, so I made this 
set of bowls for him. I actually got seven bowls out of there. This this log was so tall that I, I took a slice off of it about three and a half, four inches thick off the log. And then I turned a, a shallow bowl this diameter. It's about, uh, about three inches, three and a half inches high. Uh, and then I got two cores out of that. And I actually got Got these two plus two more out of this. So I got seven yeah. bowls out of this one log. We got that from Martin years ago. And what are you Martin using to core that? What, your, what are you using to core with? I, I didn't catch what? What do you, what's your coring tool? I have the, the one way coring system. Okay. I, use number, I use the number three knife on this. I almost never use the four, which would be It'd be cored out something this big out of a 20 inch log, but uh, I use this number three and a number two mostly. And how do you, how are you lifting like, that? How are you lifting that log? How are you getting that maneuvering that log around? Uh, usually, Doc and I will help me get it on the saw to, to get it split, but uh, yeah, it takes two people. And I, I, I could lift it, but manhandle it on the saw, well, I, I'll ask for help on that. But, then it turned it, I just knocked the corners off to get a get it on the lathe and, and then uh, round it off on the lathe. The lathe makes stuff round. I don't round them on the table so, or on a bandsaw. I just knock the corners right. off. Questions for Ron? So this is finished with water locks. I got three coats of water locks on it. <laughs> That's beautiful work. Any questions for Ron? Okay, thank you, Ron. Uh, Tim Sieber, what do you got today? Well, last last time near the end, somebody mentioned the Ellsworth School of Wood Turning, and I mentioned I had been there about a month ago, and you had <laughs> meant, you had asked if I had any photos, so I put together a, some photos if you want to see them. Yeah. Can All you right, figure then. Out the I'll uh, share screen. Give it a try. Looks like you have sample of your work laying behind you there. I do have mine behind me. Yes. The. Uh, all right. So, are we good to go? We are. All righty. Uh, I this is actually in the form of I put this in a video, so I'll pause it to as we go through. Um, Again, this was about a month ago. I was there for three days. Yeah, somebody mentioned they're going there. Um, if you're not from a rural area, and I am, uh, that's the last turn. It's a gravel road, and you might not think it's a road, but uh, that takes you up to, uh, up to uh, his house. Very pretty land, obviously, in northern, northwestern um north carolina every day we spent we started at 8 30 we spent a few <coughs> minutes every day just talking uh about anything from his experiences to uh wood turning in general he has a lot of um crafts around his house this was uh something he had just acquired a month or so earlier i think was when it was delivered somebody locally there had built this coffee table. And so he has things like this just all over. Um, on the bottom, the person embedded a little stone. So that's actually my phone laying on the floor, taking a picture from the bottom. The gentleman that built this uh, has it with a stone. So, uh, and at lunch, similar, very enjoyable conversations about his experiences through the years. Uh, his wife, Wendy, does beadwork, which I just thought I should throw in there a little bit. Uh, she is just outstanding. Uh, this is movable. You, you can flip it and turn it, and it rotates. It's sort of beaded hinge work. Um, she was very, again, nice to talk to and everything. Uh, this, starts, this starts showing you we started uh, Friday morning, and most of the morning was uh, David demonstrated his cuts uh, on a lathe 
And so most of the morning was spent with his demonstrations and how you do his, his six basic cuts. How many people were in the workshop? He typically takes five. Uh, one person wasn't there at the last minute. His wife tested positive for COVID, so he decided to uh, stay home. Uh, I was from Pennsylvania, the, the green-shirted gentleman that you can't see his face. He was from Ohio. One person was local, and one person was either Southern North Carolina or South Carolina. Uh, so very, very small group. Um, uh, David rotated around, keeping an eye on everybody at all times. So it was it was the perfect size workshop uh, from my point of view, I thought. For all lathes robust? Yes, he and he sells them uh, to and I don't know, I don't know size numbers. Uh, two very large ones, which is what he's turning on, and then three, they were full size lathes, but they were, I'll say, uh, one model smaller. So he had five lathes. Um, four dust collections hanging off the ceiling, which we never used because we were turning green wood uh, and we were not sanding anything there. So we never actually used his dust collection. He has um, uh, air to all, so you can blow out when you're doing the hollow forms and stuff. Uh, so he had quite a, quite a setup there. Again, perfectly sized for five people. Uh, like I mentioned, we, we did no sanding, all green wood. His experience over the years, for anybody that's getting into this, he uses strictly poplar and cherry. And the reason for that is he has never found anybody that has an allergy to it. And so he doesn't turn anything in his, uh, well, he turns stuff, but he, you know, when he's doing workshops, that's the only two woods he uses. And he has enough land, he goes out and cuts it right off his property. Yeah, he turns a lot of ash for his own work as well. Yes, for his own work, I think he does. Here's his cuts. That's his exterior cuts, interior cuts. So there's his six cuts he showed. Um, I put this in here because I do know that, that this video is shared with everybody. I thought it was important. This particular picture came, I took straight out of his book. So I wanted to make sure it, anybody that saw this realized this is uh, straight out of his book and it should be noted that way. But it shows there was a talk last week about the shape of how he ground the gouge. And you can clearly see he has a little bit of a convex uh, curve on his grinding there. And I remember when we were making the book, the discussion was, well, should we get an illustrator to clean those drawings up and make them nice and drafting? And no, 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 David draws with a big fat pencil and we're just gonna keep the drawings the way he makes them. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I bought the book and, I, and anybody, anybody that ever goes to the workshop, just go ahead and buy the book because, um, it's such a great reminder because you're not going to remember everything over three days. So I have found the book to be just great to uh, to use to refresh my memory from those three days. There, there is again. That's out of the book. Uh, there was my first bowl at the end of the day. Of course, well, I just took that picture this morning, actually. But you can see green wood moves. Um, I put that in there not to show my work, but to show this. He spent he spent a fair amount of time talking about how to get your your uh, blank lined up so that you can get the patterns uh, matched with symmetry and everything. And so that's really the reason I put the photo of what I did in there was to show how nicely centered it was. The other thing, the, those of you, I've only done this two years. I, I personally had never heard of putting a second foot on a bowl. 
he uses that second foot that would not be part, you know, of uh, getting it on your lathe uh, with your chuck. He uses that to help line everything up when he's turning that outside curve off at the very end of the process. Um, he uses that foot for that purpose. Um, so I don't know if and there's another picture of a uh, little bit of a difference between the quality of his foot. That's a picture of one of mine. So I'd remember to do the foot. His foot's a little cleaner than my foot. Uh, so the, but the smaller one, the smaller one is the chucking tendon and the larger one is the guide foot, yeah? Correct, exactly, exactly. Uh, he, he said, you know, it helps, again, it helps line that curve up so that when you're doing that final, you know, finishing up with your jam chuck and everything, um, it helps you get that more consistent curve around that bottom part um, was what he explained. As I recall, he used to call that a base cut. He had a large shoulder there that he cut in the back, and then he put his tenon on for the chuck. Yeah. I've seen okay. a couple of illustrations. That would make sense. Just photos. Um, He's really good. If anybody's never tried this, boy, can he get a bow lined up using his uh, thumb? Uh, he he claims there is no, no, nothing else that has a better tactile feel than just using your thumb. And of course, if it's off a millimeter, he'll he'll back off the tailstock and move it ever so slightly and back it back in. So I don't know if anybody else. Again, that's one. Uh, being new to this, I had never heard of that, but it it sure does work. You get a really nice tactile feel there. The, the fingers can detect uh, less than a thousandth of an inch easily. Yeah, I mean, I'm impressed with that method. Yeah, I I do that. You showed your the the, the inside of your bowl to get alignment. I do that a lot of times I'm doing a natural edge. What I'll do is I'll measure with a ruler from the headstock over to a point on the bowl, like to the, the separation between the sapwood and the heartwood and get that dimension the same from the top and the bottom, roll the bowl 180 degrees and get that measurement and all of the center point of the tailstock in order to get that. And you get it pretty centered that, that way. Saturday uh, was really a, a somewhat about uh, continue practicing, but this time we went after a live edge, which I think in all four bowl cases uh, being green wood, the, the edge, the bark fell off rather quickly. And we didn't really care. That wasn't the purpose. Again. Well, you have a nice, uh, a nice little bit of cambium layer, the, uh, the actual only living growing part of the tree right there. So that's kind of, I like to preserve that when I can. It just looks like dirty slime, but it's actually the, 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 the heart of the tree right there, the heart and the soul of it. Right, yeah. Uh, somebody mentioned last week his, uh, his interest in body positioning and everything. Now this is his hollow form. You notice how long his handles are compared to some of the commercial sorbies and stuff you buy with relatively short handles on for hollowing, but he certainly uh, has long handles. Um, again, these are straight out of his book. His, his, his hollowing tools, you heat them with uh, a torch and pull them out and you glue the new tip in with uh, just CA glue. No hex screws or anything on his tools. And we spent time learning how to sharpen them and on Saturday. I'd like to learn how to not break them. I bought one of those and I broke it the first time I used it. Oh, really? I think that's my, my technique. Nice picture there. Is that yours? That's mine. Yeah. Nice piece of wood. 
yes, I, that he has a uh, nice wood to work with. And you're hollowing in from the uh, side, so the pith of the wood is running through the center of that piece, sideways. Uh, sideways, yeah. Is that a board hole or just is that cut with a tool? Oh, oh board holes. Oh, gee. He, he couldn't have said enough bad things about boring a hole with a <laughs> Forstner bed. <laughs> he, I mean, and he gave a good reason. It wasn't just technique or anything. He said, particularly in green wood, he said that that boring creates so much heat that it creates tension in the wood and all that's going to do is create cracks and, and checks later on that, uh, that just using your, your tools, your gouges and, and so on, uh, that won't do it. So yeah, he had a really sounded like a very good reason why you don't want to uh, bore that hole with a Forstner bit. Uh, he was very firm about, about that idea. Um, and so that's, uh, that's right. something you can see him sitting in the background there by, by this was day three, really, this was Sunday by day three. He, again, he would, he would sit there. He, he couldn't sit down very long. He might be there three, four or five minutes. And then he'd be up coming over to talk to one of the four of us. One of the turners, Tom, uh, he was he was uh, a step above or two steps or three steps above the rest of us. So he got a little bit uh, uh, different instruction from time to time, shall we say, uh, for his needs. So it is personalized. Uh, he'll he'll talk to you about at whatever level you're you're at. He will uh, discuss things with you. There it is this morning, all, all bent and turned and, you know, but I'll keep them certainly. Nice as, piece. As souvenirs. That's straight uh, from his book. Again, he shows here the next slide. He shows the steps on how he likes to hollow with his tool, obviously. Yeah, uh, he mentioned he mentioned his uh, his saw box. So at the end, we uh, the last day we went out. He showed us his uh, saw box, his design, or at least the one he uses may not be his. Um, and he had he gave us a he emailed us a plan for the specs to build that. That's an effective design, a very useful design. Yeah, and and um, I'd have had to guess a little bit. Again, I, I I've been wanting to build a saw box, so actually the first thing I did when I came back was build one very similar to this out of the wood I had laying around. I would uh, I would have had to think about what when you're looking at that picture, what that top right corner is for, uh, but to to lay your your half section there and cut off the corners and stuff uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, if you look, if you, this, uh, I've zoomed way in on that one photo now. Um, he does not, he does not lay his logs sort of parallel to the ground. Uh, he, and he does not paint the ends of them. He stacks them. So he, that's how he stores his logs when he cuts them. He stacks them, puts some sawdust on top, maybe puts a little wedge or something on top. Um, he does not paint the ends of his wood, um, which again is not something I had heard of, um, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, underneath that, that one that's sort of in the forefront with the wedge on, um, there was a guess, uh, a gecko nest with eggs underneath that one. So he wasn't planning on disturbing that for a while. He picked <laughs> up the thing and there was a little gecko with eggs. 
we're on the hour, but we'll run over to yeah. you. Where you? Yeah, we're we're all oh, that one last. I think this is it right here. Uh, if he wants spalding, he he pours some beer in there before he stacks those logs. He claims that the beer will help the spalding, and I think that's well. One, yeah. Here's an end of these handles. Oh, uh, we're not. Yeah, we'll have to. We'll stop there, but. The, he does have a showroom in his the end of his shop with some of his work, but you can see these pictures anywhere of his work. Yeah, we have a we, we he gave us a tour of that. We have a video that's had about six thousand views that uh, uh, is a tour of his collection and a conversation a couple of years ago. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I didn't realize they were for sale until just recently. Until I got home here and somebody else sent me an email saying, hey, did you know that stuff was for sale? It's anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to 7,000. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, that's it. That was my experience. And uh, the very last slide actually has everybody's names on it to give them credit. But we won't get to that. Oh, well. Okay. But thank you. Any uh, questions for Tim before we wrap up? Great review. Thank you. Very informative. Nice slideshow. Yeah. Glad you got to do that. I think it's important. David's pretty old now and he's getting creaky. So if you got anybody wants to do the do his workshop, get on the list. Uh, it won't be offered forever. So well, he he did say he kept complaining. He says he inherited this from his parents. Uh, he now has a slight tremor. Now I couldn't see it, and he can still turn a bowl a hundred thousand times better than I can, but he claimed he has a slight tremor now, but I, I couldn't notice it. Well, I noticed last time I saw him is he's getting creaky like all of us. So uh, uh, well. he, he gives a lot to a workshop, but it takes a lot out of him. He's going to, it's, it's hard, a lot of it, but it's, yeah. it's very much a good experience. Uh, we had a couple of guys on here with their hands up. Uh, I'm sorry. We're going to get to you next week. Um, and uh, thank you all for another fascinating Woodturner's Coffee Hour. Wood shop. Thank God for wood. <laughs> <laughs>